Finance Chair Marvin Abney. Thank you for coming in today, sir. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate your taking the time to come in to talk right to folks because you had a meeting yesterday, an update on the fiscal situation facing the state. And let's just talk a little bit about what we learned yesterday. We knew at the end of this budget process for FY18 that the state was already facing a $25 million shortfall that the governor was supposed to address. Now we've heard mid-year we're looking at a $60 million shortfall for FY18, and that's before we even get to FY19. So let's talk a little bit about these numbers that you heard yesterday and how to even begin addressing it. I think it's always difficult to just deal in numbers because there were some, some high numbers that we heard last night. Uh, and I want to give kudos to the fiscal staff for doing such a good job of, of making sure that the numbers were there for us to see. But they are big. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're insurmountable, but they are big. And what that tells me is that we've got a lot of work to do, particularly within the executive branch and administering the, uh, the programs. And we've got a lot to do in terms of predicting uh, next year how we're going to solve those. So I learned a lot. Uh, I realized that there are some things that structurally that we may be able to do uh, coming up soon. But right now, the numbers are big. Can't deny that, but they're not insurmountable. So we do know that the governor's, one of her plans to address, again, that existing $25 million that she knew that had to be filled was this early retirement plan. But now we're looking at $60 million. And I know you just mentioned they are big numbers, but is this a management issue on the executive side? Is, is there a mismanagement issue going on if there's such a disconnect halfway through this administration that we're, we're seeing? This is the first time we've seen a mid-year budget deficit for years since the previous administration. Is there a mismanagement issue? I think if you heard, as I did, the other members of the Finance Committee, that seemed to be a theme of the questions that they were asking. Because again, no matter what the numbers are, if they're managed correctly, uh, you, you, you have a better chance of making sure that at the end of the day, they come out correct. So I don't know that it was mismanaged, but I do know that uh, there were other ways, I believe, that, that, the, that the numbers could have been managed. Now, what we did learn, and in fairness to the administration, was that a lot of the reasons that some of the things that my members were asking about uh, many of them are statutory. You know, you, you can talk about retirements. We talked about some of the other programs. But by law, there are some things that they can and cannot do. So that's why I'm really hesitant to say that it was intentionally mismanaged. Could it have been managed better? Yeah, I think so. But I know that it's very, very difficult uh, when you're trying to run programs, when you're trying to reduce budgets. I, I would say this. My background is military. And we spent a lot of time learning how to be uh, good managers as well as war fighters. And one of the things you have to do is to remain engaged with the people who are running your programs to know early on when you have an issue. And I think that was the thing that, uh, that my committee member was saying. We're six months mm -hmm. into this year, and now it looks like people are getting to become really serious about uh, solving this problem. That's what, if anything, was scary to me, more than the fact that something was mismanaged. And so you say that, finding out when that problem is occurring, having those lines of communication open. You know, we have seen in the past months here some issues with running programs, running UHIP, understanding where the problems are. Is there a lack of communication between the administrators and the executive branch, if you will, not letting them know that these issues are burgeoning and getting to this nearly breaking point? I, I think that there is some, uh, some truth in uh, when you're running large organizations that if you don't stay on top of it as a manager, you can miscommunicate. When we have the three top administrators uh, you know, in the executive branch talking to us, I realize that a number of times it's not just them. They don't know all the answers, mm. but they have other departments that have to report to them. So there has to be a great line of communications in order for you to know really day by day if possible, but certainly week by week, month by month, what's happening so that nothing is a surprise to you. And a lot of questions were on that very issue of were the departments managed better or could they have been managed better? Now, I don't like to get into food fights with, uh, you know, with the administration or, or with us because we're in the legislature and they're the ones having to run these programs. Mm -hmm. But there is no doubt that there are some communications that could be better to make sure that we at least know well ahead of time because it's us who's at the end of the mm. day 
that it has to say yay or nay to the new programs that we haven't even talked about that may come up. Did you have a sense of this $60 million number leading into today? Or again, are we at the six month mark and it's, wow, it's 60 million? I didn't have a sense that it would be exactly 60 million, but I had a sense that it was going to be bigger than what it was normally. Because as you recall, I think it was back in July or so, uh, we got the first indication that part of the 25 million that uh, was supposed to be used to balance the budget, there was some issues with some overruns on that. Mm -hmm. So that alerted my antenna that, hmm, mm. okay, <laughs> but this is back in July and maybe some steps can be put in that will mitigate that. I didn't realize un uh, until last night that it looks like the steps that, uh, that they're taking are just now being taken. Now, that may not be completely true, but that's the sense that I got. And again, it's the sense that many of my members got. So when you talk about that, that the steps are just being taken, should action have been taken sooner? I think if, 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 the, uh, if the, the top administrators had known some of the departments were, uh, were going to overrun as much as they did, if they'd, if they'd known that sooner and acted on it sooner, it may not appear now that nothing was done. Mm. Uh, we did get corrective action plans from the, the different uh, groups, but we, got, but we got those corrective action plans uh, just over the last week or so, mm. and it really didn't give us a long time to look through a lot of them. Not that some weren't good, but again, there's the appearance that there was not an urgency in making this happen. So all of that leads into what seems like to be mismanagement. But I won't say that it was mismanagement uh, yet because we still have six months to go. And I'm the kind of person, Kate, that at the end of the day, we are going to solve this problem. We are going to have a balanced budget. And it does mean, though, that maybe some new programs or maybe programs that are, are in existence really have to be looked like. Because you, you remember we're operating in an environment where we're not raising taxes. In fact, as, as, as much as we can, we're lowering taxes. We're trying to lure more people here with jobs. So while we've stabilized the budget in the sense that it is functioning as one should, uh, preparing for the unknowns is always a real difficult thing to do. And I think that that could have been better handled. So I, now we're at the point here, uh, early December, we're expecting a corrective action plan from the governor's administration early in January. Is this going to be the, essentially the top of your to-do list, the top of your plate, when the assembly's back in session in January. Well, every corrective action plan is at the top of our plate. Uh, in January, actually, the uh, the governor has to uh, produce pretty much the budget that that uh, that's going to be used for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. In that, maybe some corrective actions. And and again, we do have some corrective action plans for some of the agencies uh, that were were get, supposed to give them to us. But that absolutely will be at the top because you. The things that you don't do in fiscal year 2017 and 18 carries over into 2019. And that's what keeps me up at night, is that if we, if we look out to 2019, the numbers get even bigger. So yeah, I'm gonna be scrutinizing what we get from the governor in January very closely. Mm -hmm. And every program that's in existence, this is difficult because some of the, the overruns and the costs come out of those programs that deal with human services. And those costs are continuing to rise. It's a lot of what you hear about you here, but it's other things too. There are contracts, there may be some legal settlements and things that we have to be concerned about. So those costs are not diminishing. So I'm gonna be really looking at things like that very closely, which means that some new initiatives that may be put forth will really have to be looked at. Okay, and let's talk a little bit. You said FY19, keeping you up at night. The numbers that we've heard for FY19 look in excess of 200 million. You talk about 60 seeming like a big number. As 200, I mean, you can't early retire your way out of 200 million dollars. <laughs> no, you can't. And that, that is one of the reasons, Kate, that I stay away from numbers. They make good press, they make good headlines, but numbers change all the time. Uh, and you have to re remember that the process is that we in the House don't make these numbers up by ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of the House, <clears throat> the Senate, the governor's office, what's happening in the economy outside. All of those things have to do with making those numbers. So yeah, 200 million seems a lot, but I can tell you that there are other states who have numbers that are just that big, mm -hmm. and it is scary. And it causes you sometimes not to have budgets that function well. 
But I can tell you that we are going to make it work, whatever it is. And again, it might mean that a lot of the things that people want in the future, they may not get. So we heard these numbers yesterday. We're looking towards January. What's your schedule like between here and there, again, tackling this overwhelming issue? Well, we're going to be on top. Well, first of all, we've, we've gotten, I think, most of the correction action plans that we should have, and my staff are looking at those as we speak. So we're going to be in, in communications with, uh, with the departments through, their, uh, through the correct channels, uh, probably weekly or monthly, to see what's really happening. Okay. Because you have to remember, by the time we get the budget, then there are 74 people other than myself and the House representatives that have a say mm -hmm. in, in how we work that. So it's not just me. I am the chairman of the House Finance Committee, but I have to recommend a budget and defend it on the floor. So we're going to start very early, uh, and, he, and myself, even before uh, January, as I have uh, most of the summer, keeping up with what's really going on. We're not the ones who are, are administering the budget. Mm -hmm. We do set some parameters and we do produce it to a degree, but we're not the ones who administer those budgets. So most of our work is through looking to see what has happened uh, and asking as we go through, which is what I think should have been happening with the departments and, and the, the administrative directors all along. It's a matter of knowing. It is a matter uh, of knowing. But the numbers scare you. They, they, they scare you to death, but you just don't know. And, and again, part of uh, what's happening with it is that there is such an uncertainty, Kate, of what's going to happen nationwide because a lot of, the, not a lot, but some of the, uh, the programs that we're talking about may not have as big a numbers depending on what happens uh, in Congress. Mm -hmm. So that unknown is there, which muddies the water a little bit. There are some unknowns. And kind of one final question, Chairman, while I have you in here. One of your colleagues, Pat Serpa uh, has just made comments about UHIP saying maybe we might need to start all over again, that it's so broken that the state is best. And again, chair of house oversight, she says, let's start from the beginning. What was your reaction to her comments? Yeah, you know, I know Pat very well, and we, we've had uh, committee meetings together. In fact, she used to be one of the vice chairs of the finance committee, and we had a um, uh, finance committee and an ethics committee joint meeting uh, earlier, I think during the summer, addressing this issue. And Pat's very passionate about that. This is what I say when you have a system that big. Uh, it's difficult at best. But there is a decision point, and this mm -hmm. is what I mean by good management. Mm -hmm. There is a decision point where you have to say, am I getting diminishing returns on what I have in place? And if I keep going, what would be the advantages? I don't know that anybody knows that at this point, but we are getting close to that point where uh, we have to make a decision whether to stop or to keep going. I'm not one who says trash everything at this moment because I'm concerned about the, res the result of that could mean it has a ripple effect on people who need the services. Mm -hmm. It has a ripple effect on, on employees who, who would be doing that. So we would be trading one ill for, for another. So when you look at the big, big, big picture, I, I think that uh, in the future, if, uh, if we have to, I would say once more before I pull the trigger, I would try to bring in as many experts as possible. And this is the reason why I say that. You remember uh, when Obamacare first came out, all of the glitches mm -hmm. that it had, not unlike what we're seeing here. Uh, they brought in experts from all over the, the country to try to fix the problem. And I think that that's what we try to do now. But before I ditched it completely, I would do everything possible because once you do that, then the diminishing returns on what you've spent you have to be concerned with, and then you start over from where. So that's my, my, my view on that. It's a very, very tough decision uh, to make whether you keep going or not. It's like taking off in an airplane. Once you reach a particular speed, you got to take off. You know? <laughs> got to take off. Finally, legislatively, we are yeah. expected to be hearing from the Senate this week on revised yeah. legislation for the POSOX that would only be taken up in the new session. What are you looking for? You know what the legislation is on the table right now. They've talked about it. What's in play as we expect to hear from the Senate this week? Well, first of all, we've got to hear from the Senate to see what, what it is uh, that, that comes out of the hearings. Uh, we've had a couple of hearings on the, the, the POSOX uh, ourselves. And our concerns were, one, transparency, uh, making sure that if you're going to enter 
any kind of a deal, whether it's a business deal or whether it's a you know a public partner pro uh, 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 private ship kind of thing, you have to be working off of the same information as much as legally possible. So what I'm going to be looking for is how much more transparent can we be? I recognize that, and I think as a result of in our committee meetings, we ask and I said that there's more information, particularly about your finances, that we're going to need. Without that, it's an uphill battle. I think we've met somewhere uh, in the middle of that. Somewhere in the middle. There's yeah. been some reactions to Auditor Hoyles saying, I've looked yeah. at the financials. Why can't the state say, as part of a deal, you need to disclose them? There, I don't believe is a law that says that there cannot not be disclosed. Right. Well, could the state put that type of pressure on? I, I, th I, think, I think the state, you know, uh, in reality could say that, you know, is that if we don't see the entire, your entire financials. And publicly, available publicly, to the public. Publicly, yeah, then we're less likely to do X, Y, Z in that, that uh, term. Because quite frankly, uh, I talk to people a lot who, that you got several kinds of folks. Some folks say, I don't want to have anything to do with this project. Uh, if it's going to have public money. Mm -hmm. Then you have those who say, particularly who live up in the area, say, well, if, if we don't do this, then the area in which I live is going to be severely affected. You can't ignore that mm -hmm. either, you know. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the sentiment out there is that if you don't get the financials as you're talking about, uh, a lot of people are not going to support that. And I think you'll see that with the representatives who represent particularly different areas. So. I would hope that that would be one of the things that the Senate, uh, uh, you know, talks about. But it's in their court at this point. They're the ones who are having the meetings, uh, and this is going to be interesting to follow. But I'm going to be looking for as much transparency because, for me, uh, it is a matter of making sure that I do all that I can to protect the public's interest uh, in this. Okay, we're going to have all eyes on the Senate this week waiting to see the revised legislation, but I appreciate your taking the time to come in today after yesterday's meeting to provide viewers with an update of the budget situation and what we could possibly expect <coughs> moving forward. Chairman, I anticipate we will have you back in here in the near future. I would love to come back and discuss it, uh, discuss anything really about <laughs> it. I think it's important that people understand uh, how our budget works and, and what we're doing, because there's always a lot of misconceptions, mm -hmm. but that's normal. Mm -hmm. Uh, through organizations like what you're doing, I'm always glad to come out and, and give an inside peek on how we try to make this thing work. Well, Chairman Abney, I appreciate your taking the time. I'll let you go around the corner, and we'll have you back in soon. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, Chairman it. Abney, I'll let you off to the races. House Finance Chair Marvin Abney here in studio today to provide us with an update. House Finance was given some updated financials yesterday about both FY18, now as we discussed as part of that budget, back when it was approved, it was already to fill a $25 million hole that the administration was responsible for. Now they're saying that number looks closer to 60, FY19, more than $200 million deficit projected. We'll be sure to talk with Marvin moving forward. We appreciate the chairman coming in today to talk with us here at Go Local. We'll be right back here in the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. Don't go anywhere.